Um, Very good. So today we have uh, Dr. Michael Altman, uh, who's an assistant professor of radiation oncology at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he uh, earned his PhD in medical physics in 2010 from the University of Chicago um, and joined the medical physics faculty in 2012 after completing a residency at uh, Henry Ford Health System. Uh, is that in Detroit? It is in Detroit, yep, okay. downtown Detroit. Yeah. Um, so he's the um, uh, Director of Education for Medical Physics Division in the Department of Radiation Oncology and Director of the Master of Science in Medical Physics Program, um, which is a CAMPAP uh, accredited uh, program uh, out at um, Washington. And um, you know, we're delighted to uh, have him here today to, to talk a little bit about what medical physics is uh, and about the uh, program uh, that they have at uh, Washington University. Thank you very much, Joe, for the introduction, and I apologize again for being a few minutes late. Um, so uh, as Joe said, I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, we have, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our field because it's kind of an, an unusual area of medical physics or of physics in general, if you're not um, used to it. <laughs> not Most of us kind of almost find it, a lot of us have found it almost by accident. Um, I myself started doing a project in the area as an undergraduate. That's how I got into the field, but we're trying to make sure more people know about it as an option because a lot of us who work in it do feel like it is a it's a good career. So um, I will go ahead and get started. So just acknowledge I've taken some of these slides like based on and from some others in our group and um, use some of the the some of the things I'm going to show you today from some of these other sources. So medical physics is we really have several functions. Um, most involve the use of radiation or radiant energy in medical applications. Like it kind of is what it says on the label a little bit. Um, a lot of us do work that does stuff in the clinic. So we work with physicians to help design techniques and methods for using um, radiation or radiant energy in medicine. Um, we can work with patient interactions to help they make sure they're being performed optimally and safely. We do a lot of quality assurance and quality control to verify things are working optimally because there are some dangers for people when working with radiation. And we want to ensure the safety of radiation workers and the public. Um, a lot of us do some R&D, uh, both developing new techniques and technologies and enhancing um, kind of currently existing techniques and technologies. And then there's a teaching and training element, which I'm a part of, which is part of training our kind of next generation of medical physicists, um, as well as helping train medical personnel and other personnel in the hospital. We kind of do training and teaching for all different groups. We can work at hospitals. We can work at academic institutions, which are sometimes mixed with the hospitals. And those of us who work at, especially at like academic hospitals, I'll say, or academic medical centers, we a lot of times have clinical duties and research duties and teaching duties. Um, but you can work at places where you just do clinic. Um, some academic institutions, maybe you're just doing research or teaching, although those are a little bit more common nowadays. There's also industry jobs, there's government agency jobs. Um, I didn't kind of list it here, but some, some medical physicists work in consulting groups um, that do different things for different people as well. So med people basically, as soon as they discovered radiation, which was back in uh, 1895 when uh, Wilhelm Röntgen discovered x-rays, and that is a picture of, if you've never seen this image before, this is his wife's hand and her wedding ring. Um, so one of the first x-rays ever taken. Um, basically since then, and you know, Marie Curie isolates radium and some of these other things, they've pretty much since this time had tried to figure out what to do with radiation and have looked into medical uses for it. So since very early, there have been physicists who've been involved in um, medical use of radiation in some way, shape, or form. Today, medical physics has really three or four main disciplines. Uh, there's diagnostics, which, and I'm gonna talk about each of these kind of uh, in series. There's diagnostics, therapeutics, which is what I do, nuclear medicine, and then radiation safety, which can sometimes be its own job, but can sometimes be wrapped into, like a lot of the responsibilities of radiation safety can also be wrapped into the other parts of the profession as well. So we'll talk about diagnostics first. 
as we just showed you with Ronkin, X-ray projection imaging is kind of one of the really basics and the really one of the real lifebloods of um, diagnostic imaging. So if you don't know how an X-ray works, essentially you have some kind of X-ray beam and then you would have different materials in the body. And if you have film or some kind of detector in behind it, what happens is that you get differential amounts of attenuation, depending if you are going through just solid tissue or going through areas with bone or going through areas with air, and you can see those differences. So you get something that looks like this with an X-ray. More photons will reach detectors going through air pockets like the lungs, which is why you can see that. And then more will be blocked if you're going through bones. So you see the differences in them. Um, and that's kind of like the basic X-ray, but some of the developments that have been made with that X-ray imaging are things like this. This is what's called a digital subtraction angiography. An angiography is an image of vessels. Um, so here you can see that they took an image um, with contrast. So basically they put something in here that, that blocks more of the X-rays. And what you do is if you could take a series of these and then you do manipulation of the images offline using image processing and computer vision theory, you can actually get, this is the same patient, this is the same image. This is just a manipulation with series of images to give you differential contrast. You could see maybe the kidneys, maybe more of the vascular structure here. And so some of the, uh, the research, not only in just like X-ray, planar X-ray, but also in some of the other imaging techniques I'm gonna tell you is really rooted almost in, in a lot of its in computer science elements or in image processing and image analysis elements. Um, and this is like an ongoing area of research in the field. Um, a big one, so I'm gonna go through kind of some of the big modalities that people in uh, radiology usually manage with. This is computed tomography or CT. So basically you have an X-ray tube and a set of detectors, but instead of leaving the X-ray tube alone, what you do is you rotate it around a person. So this is, the person would lay here on the table and then their bot, the table would move through this hole, the body. I don't know if you've ever had a CT, but this is basically how they work. And then you have an X-ray tube that rotates around the body. And what happens is, is that at each rotation, you get an image, like a, an X-ray of a, of a little slice or plane of you. And so the image may look like this, depending on what things are in, like are being attenuated. What they do is they do some mathematics to basically take this image and map it into this, what they call a projection image. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna go around at each angle and make a series of these projections all around the circle. And what you get is you get these different views of these projections. And so what happens when you have that, because a CT is really just as a small row of the body that you're imaging, is that you use mathematical techniques that basically you take the projection that comes at an angle and smear it backwards along lines. And what happens is, is that as you get more projections, you can recreate the image that was there originally. So here would be like a very limited number of views, but as you get more and more projections, you can get better specificity and better um, spatial resolution about what the object looks like. And so that's kind of the fundamentals of how CT works. And, um, what you get in the end is something that looks like this. If, oh, I have to change it to a cursor. So this is a standard CT. Now, this is technology that's been developed. What medical physicists will do who work in CT is that the clinical physicists, what they may do is they may make sure that the images are of sufficient quality. They may make sure that the machines are running properly. They may also help to look into different techniques that you might use for cases where you need to kind of make sure that you're not as giving as much radiation. And then what people in the field are doing research is looking how you can use this image and maybe do computer vision work with this image or developing new technology to make the images faster or make the images a better quality among uh, many other area, active areas of research in CT. Another big one that you find in diagnostics is MRI or magnetic resonance imaging. So basically you have protons that have an intrinsic spin. And essentially, if you put it in a magnetic field, the spins are either gonna align with it or without it. But in the body, the protons, and usually what you're really imaging with, with MRI is the water, 
in your body a lot of times. So it's the protons that are spinning in, in, in water molecules and you're kind of looking at how the magnetization moves when you put different magnetizations with it. So if you put a net magnetization, like a big magnet, some protons will align with it and some will align against it. More tend to align with it than without. So what happens is, is that your body gets a net magnetization. So you basically have these big superconducting magnets that you have coils of wire that are inside the MRI. This is a clinical MRI. If you've ever had an MRI, this is maybe most likely what you had. And the body goes inside. Basically, it has these magnetic fields, which kind of go around it so that you have a net magnetization inside the magnet. So all of your protons line up or the, the net magnetization of your body lines up with the magnet of the MRI. And this is what's called a closed MRI. You can also have one that looks like this, which is called an open MRI. Um, you'll see advertisements sometimes for places that have open MRIs. What they mean is this, instead of like the, the bore, the hole that we think of, they look more like this. And these are, it works very similarly. It's just that the field is designed differently. And the benefit of the open MRI is actually you can fit larger individuals inside of it. So that's one of the benefits of it. It's also maybe a little better for people who are very claustrophobic. And they can make actually uh, very large, either bore or open MRIs for imaging animals. And so uh, at the, if you, like at the zoo, somewhere they may actually have animal imagers that they might use to like image, especially larger animals, which um, most hospitals and medical centers don't really have the need for. So what the MRI basically has, it has these coils of wire that are run in different orientations. So you, you won't have just one, you'll have like one big coil that might be what they call these Z coils and or one or two. And then you'll have these other coils that are around. And the idea is that by turning on and off the magnetization in the different coils, you can make the net magnetization of the body do different things, move in different directions. And what you're imaging when you image MRI is essentially how that, M, that net magnetization moves or moves back to kind of its home position and then you see in blue here, there's something called a transceiver. Basically you get a radio signal out of the body when that happens, when the magnetization moves back. And that radio signal is what you can actually use to turn into images. Now with an MRI, what you tend to do too is that you may actually put these other coils around parts of the body. So these are, this is a head coil. So your head would stick in here. This one's for like a, a, a leg. It's an extremity coil. And this one may be for the body. And the idea is that you can get better resolution if you get with, do some more finer refinement with the magnetic field closer to the body. So you'll put more coils around the body at various points to do different things with different images. And this is clinically, you have about a 1.5 to three Tesla. There are one that goes up even higher now. Um, they're pretty, pretty strong. They're superconducting electromagnetics and they're filled with liquid helium. So there's also a lot of maintenance and certain things that have to be taken care of with MRIs to make sure that basically you are keeping the magnetization on um, and that you like that the that nothing is, is amiss with the system. Um, so this is essentially what happens is that you start with a net magnetization, you would turn on one of the other magnets and that magnetization would move and maybe it would move into this plane like this. And then as it comes back up into essentially almost like its home position, you get a different signal out. And when it's in these different planes, you can use those different magnetic fields to turn it differently and do different things with it. And that's how you can get out different kinds of MR images. And by different kinds, I mean something like this. They call these weighted images. So you can get one, this is a proton density weighted. So this is basically a map of the strength of the proton magnetic field of different tissues in your body. You can get certain things with something that's called a T2, where water lights up bright. So in the brain, what you're looking at here, this is cerebral spinal fluid. So it looks bright and it's all, it's, this is the same person. All you're doing is you're changing the order and the time that you turn on different magnetic fields and you can get different types of signals out of the body. Um, this one is called a T1. This is also very common. This lights up fat. There's not much fat in your head usually, but that's why you see a really small little ring around here. Um, and this is something even different that's looking at maybe different manipulations of different maps of things in the brain. And they all have these different, and so part of the research in MRI is to develop the patterns 
of the way the magnets are run to look at different effects and different things. So one of the benefits of MRI over CT is that you can see soft tissue a lot better. So it's by soft tissue, I mean not bone. Um, CT and x-rays are really good at seeing bone and seeing air and seeing differences between them. MRI, you see this, this is a tumor in the liver and you can see it a lot better than you can see it here. So that's just something that, that comes up. And then you could do functional work. So you could actually see things that are happening in the body. Um, ultrasounds, another big area. I'm gonna kind of go through these a little bit faster just because I wanna make sure I get to everything and I got started a little late, I apologize. Um, basically ultrasound, the way it works is that essentially it's these piezoelectric crystals that kind of basically move in and out. Um, basically they change shape when you apply an electric field and they produce sound waves. And you can have all different types of transducers, which are these crystals that produce ultrasounds. And you can get images that look just like this, actually. You wouldn't think of this as an ultrasound, but this is actually a type of ultrasound image. It's just along one line. Or you can get kind of your standard, what you almost think of as an ultrasound. This is actually of a prostate, like that. Um, for more advanced things they do with ultrasound, they do things like Doppler imaging, which images like how, like this is of a heart, and this is how the blood is moving. So you can actually see the blood moving kind of in that, like what direction it's moving through different ventral and atria. And this is a type of research that I've done where you basically take ultrasound and you focus it like you would focus light on to fry an ant kind of, you focus it at a point. And what you can do is you can actually heat up tissue or um, either to kind of gently heat it or you can actually cook it and basically cook out a tumor point by point. That's called high intensity focus ultrasound. And you can strap one of those to an MRI and actually monitor the change in um, heat with an MRI. And so that is what's going on here. So this is heat being delivered with an ultrasound that you are monitoring dynamically inside of an MRI. And I'll kind of stop that, but you can kind of get the sense of how that would generally work. So radiation therapy is what I'm gonna talk about next. Red, radiation therapy is probably the largest area of what medical physicists do in terms, in terms of the, like the number of personnel who are in medical physicists. Most of us tend to do radiation therapy, although there are a lot in diagnostics and some of these other fields as well. Um, it's almost the opposite of what you'd see for physicians. In doctors, there are more radiologists around than there are radiation oncologists. And it's just kind of the nature of the field and our work in it. Um, essentially with radiation therapy, I'm not gonna go through everything in this slide. The upshot of it is, is that radiation damages the DNA to the cells. And in some cases, when people have cancer or when they have other diseases, you want this to happen. So this is, um, these colors are all like different chromosomes. Each different color is a different chromosome in a cell. And you can see after they've been irradiated is that the radiation can cause different types of chromosome damage. Essentially some of that is the goal is that that kills the cells. And so radiation therapy is putting this focused radiation into people to kill the cells in their body, which you would do in a focused way to try to kill cancer usually. Um, we don't do it all in one lump sum. The idea of this is that essentially you would have cancer cells and you would have normal, you would have healthy cells and you wanna kill more cancer cells than normal tissue, which only happens at lower doses. So what you do is you break it up into a lot of treatments of low dose. And um, then you get these curves more than down here where you're killing more tumor cells. So this is how many cells you are gonna live is on this, what's this graph. So you're gonna have fewer tumor cells live than normal tissue cells. And basically, if we so a lot of radiation therapy is applied in 20 to 40 sessions. So a patient comes every day of the week, not weekends usually, but every day of the week for four to six weeks and gets a treatment of radiation and then goes home and comes back the next day. And that's a lot of type ways that we treat. Um, radiation therapy has also been around a long time. Um, even what we would think of when we started thinking of the things that get a bit more advanced and modern have been since the 1960s although a lot of there's been just changes over time. So radiation therapy and this diagnostics even older have, are not new, um, but we have, they've, there's been just a lot of technology change over time. And um, also a lot, obviously, and a lot of uh, more and different involvement from physicists in these treatments. 
So in radiation oncology, you have a medical physicist, and we generally work with both the physicians who are radiation oncologists. There's something called a dosimetrist who usually generates our treatment plans, and then the therapist. And we work, one of the things about medical physics is that we work across all these different groups. And a lot of times that we help a lot of the different people to do different, to do different tasks to help make their, um, to really keep the, help to keep the clinic running, help keep the, the treatments being safe and optimal. This is the general workflow that patients would have when they come for radiation therapy. They'll do something called a simulation, which I'll explain in a minute. We get images out of that, and then we develop a treatment plan. We will make sure that the patient has some kind of markings on them, and I do mean physical markings, either with like a marker or a tattoos. And basically that helps us get them in the same place every time. So they go home and they come back and forth each day and we administer the treatment plan and we want to make sure we're administering the same plan in the same way every time to make sure their treatment is effective as possible. Um, with our machines, we are looking for an accuracy in dose of about of less than 5%. And we're looking in spatial accuracy of within one to two millimeters. So we want the, the match and the ability to treat to be very precise because that gives us the best results. A simulation is essentially a model of a patient that we're going to use to build, we use with computer programs to build a treatment plan. So this is a, an x-ray taken with a CT that's basically of the body. So the, we would figure out a point in the body that we want to image wherever their disease was, wherever the condition is we want to treat. You take an image and you might use a different CT and a different one, but you're going to collect a CT and you're going to use computer programs to build a radiation plan for their treatment off of those CTs. Sometimes we can even do more specialized things. This is what's called a 4D CT. So this is actually somebody breathing. And what happens is you take a CT at a bunch of different points. You basically have a, a marker on their body that moves with them as they breathe. And you use it, and this, this track is essentially their breathing motion. And then you kind of divide up the CT depending on what point they're breathing at. And then you can essentially get a sense of, you can make a, a CT that's almost like a movie that moves with their breath. And we can, we can make plans that work if they're trying to hold their breath, or we can make plans at different points. We can do specialized imaging in these cases to account for different things that happen in live people to help make, especially for lung treatments, these kind of images are really useful. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, essentially to say that we have developed a lot more treatment styles as things have gone on. One of the things you'll notice is that the energy of the radiation that we can apply, when it gets higher, but the other thing is, is you'll notice that they start with these very blocky kind of things where they're only, like if you're treating the middle of the body, you can only come treat from a few different angles around the body. But as you'll notice over time, the red is kind of the, the high, the red and yellows are the high dose and the blues are the lower. Over time, what we're getting to is where we can call what's called more conformal. So basically make the radiation more conform to the shape of the target. And um, now we've actually started to implement things that most of the time when you're talking about radiation therapy, you are talking about photons. But there've also been interventions where people have developed treatments with protons and with heavier ions too that have advantages. At WashU, we have treatments with photons and protons and electrons, as I'll talk about later, um, a lot of different elements. And for different people, for different disease sites, they all can have their uses and um, different abilities. This is kind of the workhorse of what we use in radiation therapy. It's a linear accelerator that's inside here. So basically, there's a waveguide that pumps in microwaves, and the microwaves are the, this waveguide, which is down here in this diagram, is up here in the machine. And there's an electron gun that shoots out electrons. The waves accelerate the electrons. They get turned with a magnet and then hit a target. And then we take the photons that come out of the target and we use those to treat patients. You can also take the target out of the way and just use the electrons to treat patients. And so the linear accelerators are what we treat most of our patients with. They lay on a couch like this and the machine can move around them. And I'll kind of show you an image of that later. Inside the machine, the way we shape the radiation to their body is one, there are some big collimators that are like big chunks of lead, but then we also have these, which is called an MLC. Essentially, it's a multi-leaf collimator. It is little leaves or sheaths 
of tungsten that move dynamically to shape the aperture of the field to the shape that we want to treat with. And on top of that, the most modern linear accelerators actually have imaging panels on them and imaging sources. And the idea is that we can take a CT or film or, or planar x-rays before treatment to make sure that our patients are aligned correctly. This is an example of a very simple treatment plan of a breast. So you basically are gonna come from either side of a breast to treat the whole thing. This is a very classic treatment. What you're seeing down here is the little leaves of the MLCs and how they are shaping to the shape of the breast. And this, this kind of blue area is what you would want to treat. And you can see, if you can see it faintly here, there's a red line. This is like the heart. This is something you want to avoid treating. So there have been various setup approaches. I'm not gonna talk much about this. Basically you can have patients lay on their back and treat them on your back. You can have them lay on their stomach, where in case here, the breast would kind of fall away from the heart. Um, this works well for some patients, not for others. So before the treatment, you also are gonna decide which way to put the patient to kind of best optimize their treatment. It's also the most comfortable for them. We use computer programs to design these plans. And then what we do is we look at these different curves essentially, which tell us how much dose different areas of the body are getting. And we can look at, this is a this thing labeled PTD. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but that is the target. And then you might look like at like, how much radiation is the lung getting? How much radiation is the heart getting? And it's a mixture of work that we can do with the plan to alter those as also well, it's to come upon our physicians that we work with to tell us how much is too much. If we need to change something, what do they want us to do? Do they want us to make less dose to the lung? Do they want us to make less dose to the heart? And then what kind of trade-offs are we doing with how much dose can we get to what we wanna to treat to our targets? And that's a lot of our work and effort is to make our plans optimal for patients to give them the best benefit without trying to minimize any side effects. Now, something we can do is those leaves are allowed to move as I showed you earlier. So we don't have to leave them still throughout the treatment. So we can start to move them into parts of the field for part of the treatment. Like you may hear, you might do 91% looking like this, and then you'll move in some of those to start to block out part, and you move some of them into block out another part. And so you're gonna start to modulate the dose within your field to better help um, not uh, basically protect parts of the patient's body. And then you can get even more complicated with your treatment. So let's say you have targets that start to, this is a similar target, but it's a little bit more complicated. It has lymph nodes that go up into the neck. It has some other things down there and you still wanna protect all these other basically healthy tissues of the body. So what we have is we have now the ability to do even more intense intensity modulation. So basically that means that we can move these leaves dynamically throughout treatment. And we can move the beam, each of these like yellow that you kind of see here, I know this is kind of confusing, but it's basically a different position. We can put the radiation beam around the body and we can shape the leaves to be even more refined, to get us even more um, conformal dose around our targets. And so we get plans that start to look much more complicated. What you're looking at here, this 100 is what we would call our prescription. It's 100% of the dose that we want. And so it is more conformed to our target. And we wanna bend more of the radiation away from the other structures. Again, this is the heart. And some of these lower dose, what we call isodose lines, or these are lower areas of dose are pulled away from things like the heart or the lungs. And then we can even go more complicated when we let the radiation beam move the whole time around the patient and we're changing the shape of the aperture. So we're changing multiple things dynamically to really give the best radiation dose to the patient. This is an example, I'll let this play for a second. There's no patient here, but this is basically the workflow of how you would do a treatment. So you would bring this, and it's a little jerky, but I think that's just a, that's the, the, the screen, not the actual beam. But what they're doing here is they're taking a CT of a patient on the table so that's the image you're seeing here. The blue is the area that they're going to wanna to treat. 
you would have the image that you took from a CT before you started treating. You're going to match the two images, which is what you're going to see next when it moves back to its home position. So this is the linear accelerator moving. And if you're wondering how heavy this is, it's, it's a few tons because um, it's lined with lead on top of everything else being on there. Uh, so what they're doing now is that they are basically looking at these images and they're going to line up the image that you started with from the simulation that we built our plan on with whatever images that we have for that day. And after they do that, what's happening as it moves is that they're going to move. So what they're doing now is they're actually, they might be taking some, some other kinds of images and then they're going to get ready and they're actually going to start treatment. So notice the patient is going to move into position. The couch moves up and down and turns to get the patient in the right position. And then what's going to happen is this is a mock-up of the, what the leaves are doing. So the leaves are moving dynamically as the machine is moving to give you that dose that really kind of conforms very well to the patient. And it said, we want to do all that with the precision of one to two millimeters and with getting our dose within 5%. So that's one kind of treatment. That is a type of treatment we do with protons. We can treat with electrons. Electrons are very useful when you have things that are very close to the surface, because this is this red line is how deep the dose kind of goes. And you can see the dose here that goes to about four millimeters from this beam. So if you have things that are very close to the surface, electrons can be very good at treating patients with. We also do something called stereotactic radiosurgery. It essentially is a very, very high dose treatment with a patient whose head is actually fixed and bolted into what they call frame. They're actually bolted into a frame and put into this machine. This is called a gamma knife, if you've ever heard the term. It's basically 192 cobalt 60 sources that are put in an array that are focused to a very, very small point so you can deliver a very high dose to a very small point. And they use this a lot for treatments of the brain. When you want to deliver a very, very high dose in a single treatment to an area of the brain, usually for um, recurrent metastases, but they can also treat different things. Um, there's a very specialized treatment where they actually destroy a nerve in the brain. Um, if patients have a kind of a chronic nerve issue, they want to treat a five millimeter part of the nerve that is right near the, the brainstem. And they basically use this kind of machine to give a lot of dose to basically destroy that area of the nerve. And you can do those kind of treatments with this because it's very, very precise. One of the things that I do is called brachytherapy. This is actually, instead of radiating from outside the body, brachytherapy is putting radioactive sources inside the body. And this can be, these kind of devices are used to treat cervical cancer. They, they basically go inside the, this, this part goes inside the uterus. Um, and then these parts sit outside. And what you have is you have a device that has a radioactive source on the end of a wire, and it goes inside each of these channels and leaves the radiation there for a short period of time and then pulls it back out. And you can use that tile type of treatment to treat the breast. This is a type of treatment that goes inside of a, of a surgical cavity in the breast. And this is actually needles that they put into a prostate. And you can treat the prostate this way. Um, this is actually for an eye treatment. And this is not with this machine. You basically, in this little gold cup, you're gonna mount radioactive seeds or radioactive sources that are very, very small, only about five millimeters long. And you sew it to the eyeball for a week. You surgically open up kind of the, the, uh, the muscle, you sew it to the eyeball, close it back up, patient goes home. A week later, you open it back up and you take this plaque off. And this is treating a type of disease called ocular melanoma. So there's a lot of different types of, of conditions that we treat. Um, and this one uses for certain ones where there's a, a body cavity or a, a kind of a good access way in, we can actually put radioactive sources into the body to treat them. Um, this is MR guided radiation therapy. Instead of using CT images, we can use MR. And what happens is you get a lot better uh, ability to see the non-bony tissue with an MR. So I'll let this play for a little bit. I'm not going to play the whole thing because I think it's kind of long. But basically what this is, is that you're seeing here the target, which is this part of something in the, uh, the GI tract. And it's essentially moving out of the way and then moving back into the target. So what they would do on an MR guided machine, 
is maybe only turn on the radiation when it's in about the right place. And finally, I talked about a little earlier, we do pro therapy with protons and heavy ions. And they have advantages that they don't pass, they kind of go to a certain point in the body, that's this solid curve, and then they stop. X-rays or photons just kind of keep going. So you get some dose. So what happens is if you're trying to treat a target here with photons is you get some dose here, but more of the dose goes past it. Photon, protons are gonna go and they're just gonna stop. So there's some types of treatments where protons are very, very useful. And basically, it's hard to see in the diagram down here, I apologize, but there's a table and this is a cyclotron that essentially moves around the patient through multiple floors. And that's how you get the proton beam kind of lined up correctly for the patient. And then we have a bunch of other modalities that we work it with um, from high intensity focus ultrasound, which I talked with, hyperthermia, which is heat. Um, and these are just different. And so one of the things that medical physicists do is that we work with all these different technologies. We can work in development of existing ones. This is kind of a brand new one. And like one of the things that um, it's basically like a, a, a CT scanner built in with a linear accelerator. And one of the things that, uh, that medical physicists do is one, we have to learn how to use all of these and make treatments optimal with all of these. But another thing is that there's a lot of work that goes into developing these new technologies, either ones that exist or um, brand new ones. So we do other things in the clinic, medical physicists, we have other tasks. One is that we may actually make models of our radiation beam in order to actually do these treatment plans. These treatment plans just don't, don't just come in a, like a box. You actually have to put in essentially a mathematical model or a measurement based model of your radiation beam in order to get accurate plans out. And so that's one of the things that we do in the clinic. Another thing that we're really responsible for is quality assurance. And this is across all the fields of medical physics. So we wanna make sure that the dose is delivered to the patient within 5% of our prescribed dose. And I kind of skipped through this a little bit, but basically you have some QA that gets done on a daily basis, some that gets done monthly and some that gets done annually. Um, let's get back. And we have, we have guidance documents from basically our professional organizations and other international organizations that tell us this is how tight the tolerance should be on different tests. This is how you would get to that 5% so that everybody is kind of working from a common standard. Um, and we can do a test. This is a test of a linear accelerator where you basically would put a ball bearing and have a piece of film or detector and this little cone, or it's like a very small collimator. And what you're essentially doing is as you rotate the machine around this point or the table or turn this collimator is you wanna make sure that all of the kind of rotation points of the system, that they all meet at the same spot within two millimeters. And this is a kind of test that we would run to determine if that is accurate. And if it is out of that specification, then trained medical physicists kind of work with engineers and other people with the machines to fix it essentially, and basically bring our treatments into the best position they could be. I'll skip that. Um, briefly about some of the things that we have done um, for our, uh, this is a, a research, um, something that we have done at WashU that, that we're kind of one of the big leaders on. Basically we took treatment plans or basically there's a lot of variability in the person who's creating them. And what we did is we realized that you might be able to look at a lot of different parameters about a plan and create kind of a computer model that says, is the plan good, which is this kind of this blue area here, or is it not? And good and bad with different parameters. And we developed this technique called knowledge-based planning. We were one of the kind of groups at the real forefront at it. There were a couple different ones that were working on it too. And then we worked with vendors to basically instill this in commercial planning systems. And so now kind of techniques that we developed at WashU as the physicists work to develop are now used in a number of clinics worldwide because they are like basically put out into, into industry. And there's other things that we have worked on. We're one of the leaders in this, which is basically radiation to a valve of the heart to help uh, correct for ventricle tachycardia. So one shot of radiation to a valve in the heart to basically help 
um, correct this condition. This is not cancer either, even though we do treat most of the cancer. Um, we do, we're, we're, there's some novel work that is being done with what they call FLASH, which is very, very high dose treatment. And also with thinking about how to, how to vary dose in different ways to kind of elicit um, better effects for our patient and better, like better end results with less side effects. Nuclear medicine is the use of radionuclides in uh, medical physics um, or in medicine, sorry. Um, you can have, a, there's a few that like there's 20, 30 different radionuclides, but they can be tagged to a whole lot of different things to use. The big, one of the big workhorses of this is what's called a gamma camera, which basically is you put radiation into a patient and it is detected. Um, by put radiation into a patient is, I mean that you inject it intravenously or they drink something that has radioactive in it. And basically inside their body, photons usually come out and they're detected by a crystal detector, which puts out photons that are amplified by a PMT and then you get an image out. And you would have an energy window depending on the radioisotope that you're going to look at. So you can get an image that kind of looks like this. This is a bone scan of a patient. And what they do is they mount these around a patient, these detectors, and then they can move them around a patient. And that is called SPECT or single photon emission computed tomography. And you can have different numbers of these, these gamma cameras mounted Two is kind of the most common. And the, what you have is you get essentially like a, a CT of the, some kind of function of the body because the radionuclides are doing different, they're not as much looking at structure like you might with a CT or MR, but they're a lot of times looking at what's going on. Where is this drug being uptaken in the bones, for example? And maybe here indicates there's something wrong. Um, PET, you might hear, which is positron emission tomography, which relies on radionuclide um, that emit positrons. And basically the positrons turn into two photons, which go in the exact opposite direction. And if you detect them, so what happens is, I'll show this picture is better. Positron gets emitted here. It turns, it, it meets with an electron, turns into two photons, which go in exact opposite directions. You have uh, detectors that are in a ring around a patient. If they detect at the same time, you know there's something there. And then basically you can take these coincidences, they call them, and basically turn them into tomographic images. So you might get something like this of the brain. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing an area of the brain with no glucose uptake. The you, uh, most common one they use in PET is what they call FDG18. It's basically a sugar that is tagged with fluorine, radioactive fluorine. And so any part of the body that uptakes sugar is going to uptake this. But this is a patient who's had a stroke. So what you're seeing or not seeing here is an area of the, of the brain that is no longer functional. And this is something that PET can tell you. And you can use all these different tracers with PET, but this is the most common is this fluorine 18. Now, one of the things they realize is that actually combining PET and CT together does even better. And so basically you would have a machine like this with a PET scanner on one side and it's strapped into a CT scanner. And the person is kind of inside of both. And the idea is that the CT gives you body anatomy and the PET gives you function. So if you kind of mix them together, you can get a really good idea of where things are functional and what like a better sense of what they look like. Because a PET image like this doesn't have very good spatial resolution, but the CT does. So you can maybe tell, like this is the heart, this is the brain. They usually take up a lot of glucose, for example. But maybe over here, somewhere over here, this may not be something that is, that is, that is normal. And so that's the kind of thing you'd be able to, to really figure out what's going on with that. Um, you can also put radionuclides into the body. And this is, um, and that's for therapeutic purposes. I mean by that, instead of just diagnostics. This is an example called microspheres, which is basically little beads that have yttrium 90 that you put into the liver to try to kill tumors. Um, and you can use that, you can use, when you do put radionuclides into the body, if you can get a signal out of them, you can actually take PET images of them or PET CT images of them and then actually see where your therapy went and, and try to correlate that to maybe how good the patient's outcome is going to be. Um, the last discipline I'll talk about briefly is radiation safety. Basically, radiation safety is involved in kind of receipt of materials, training, procedures for dealing with incidents that can include spills or missing sources, contamination, or medical events. 
It could be monitoring and management of exposure of radiation workers, compliance with regulatory bodies, and commissioning and decommissioning procedures, administrations, and sites. So you would have radiation safety physicists if a hospital that has radioactive materials, for example, closed down. You have to follow a lot of procedures to make sure it's not just a site sitting there that's radioactive. Um, you can get contamination from exposure to the body from outside. You can get internal contamination from things or external contamination from things that happen on the skin or internal contamination from things that are inhaled or swallowed, example. Um, this is a quick example. So in a spill, like let's say in a hospital, there's been a spill of radioactive material. If you have physic physicists who are specific to radiation safety, they will come and help manage. They'll make sure that people are removed once they have been vetted as clean. They'll remove any waste. They'll do work to make sure that surveys, to make sure that see if things are contaminated once they've been cleaned up, and then they will help decontaminate if you need to. And they will assess any potential hazards or radiation dose that's happened to patients or workers because of the issue. Part of this is because there are actual radiation limits that are specified by the government. And there's different limits for workers, so like people like me who work with radiation versus those who are of the general public. And these don't include medical procedures. So if I work in there, but I go get like a CT for medical reasons, it doesn't, it doesn't count to this. They have to ensure that, that we meet with regulatory compliance and that can include monitoring. These are badges that we wear on ourselves to see it, how much radiation we get on a monthly basis. And they are read out each month. Um, to, and when you're a radiation worker, you get tracked for your entire lifetime after that, as long as you're a worker of how much radiation you've gotten on the job. Um, they design, they work with architects to design the rooms that these machines have to go into because the machines have to protect, the rooms have to protect the people who work around them. Um, the people who are working, the patients and the general public, it all has to be considered. Now, I have a few minutes left to talk about medical physics careers. So most of the way that works, if you want to become a medical physicist, is you start off as an undergrad and then you would go into a, P, a master's or a PhD program, both exist. And then from there, if you want to do clinical work, usually you go into a, a residency, which is generally two years, and then you take board exams and you, you start working as your job. And if you have an accredited, and this is the body that does the accreditation, master's or PhD program, that's kind of the easiest pathway to get you into residency and the board exams. Um, one other advantage I can tell you about being a medical physicist is that the compensation is pretty reasonable. Um, I, this top row is master's and this bottom is PhD. This is 100,000 down here. And with the black bar is, is the median. Now this includes all levels of experience. If you start in the field, you're generally not gonna start at the black bar. You're probably gonna start closer to the bottom. Um, PhDs are in a little bit more, but it's not, it's, it's not a ton more, but it is a little bit more on average. Um, and this is without certification. And then this is after you get board certification. Most people will get board certification within the first couple years of working in the field uh, usually. Um, but the compensation is, as I said, very reasonable. So this is 100,000. This is 200,000 right here to give you an example. So the average in 2018 for master's degree students um, with certified people with master's degrees was about 180 to 190 K, which is pretty good. So a little bit about us at WashU in St. Louis. Um, we're the number six ranked medical school in the United States for research. Our School of Medicine, which is where our department and our program is housed, has 20 departments and 13 degree programs, including MDs, PhDs, and MSs. Um, we have our main campus, which is where our, our like master's program is housed. But our group actually runs clinics at six different clinics in the St. Louis area. And actually we run clinics in several other places in Illinois and Missouri. And so I, as a physicist, I actually do work at some of these other sites as well. Um, we have about 40 medical physicists in our group, and we typically are treating about 150 to 200 patients per day overall. Um, we've also have international collaborations. We've worked with uh, Guatemala and China, among other places. The masters, uh, so we have different programs. We have an MS program, which is pretty new. We have a PhD program that we are also developing that's going to kind of work with our master's program. We have our own residency program. So one of the advantages for us is that we will recruit from our graduate programs into our residency programs. And with our MS program, we also have a related PhD programs with the BME department. So 
you could get a master's in medical physics and then transition to a PhD in biomedical and biological imaging. So we have a very close relationship with that program. Our program is a 30 credit hour master's program. It has 24 core classes. And then you can either do a thesis project arm or a clinical project arm. Um, and this just depends on personal preference and what your interests might be. And if you are interested in learning more about the program, please go to our website, which I've listed here. Um, this is just an example of the clinical project stream. So they're very similar. The difference is the clinical project, you do a one semester clinical project. This would be an example. They commissioned a linear accelerator at a clinic. And this is like a picture of the radiation survey that they're doing. These are survey meters in their hand. They're doing a survey of the linear accelerator. This is an, a picture of like a thesis research project. And this is a, a PET MRI measurement of dose from Y90 to the liver. Um, and this is something that you could do as a master's project. And this is a two semester project. So this is the degree requirements for our program, a bachelor's degree in physics, engineering or related field, or the equivalent of a physics minor, a three GPA. You have to put in some transcripts and some letters of recommendation to the applicant, to the, um, to the application. And um, yeah, and then we usually, uh, for international students, we recommend by December 31st, but we do start accepting um, our, our deadlines for acceptance are February 1st, which we give preference to, but we have a secondary deadline on March 1st. Um, this is our tuition for this year. So this times 30 would give you an idea of the total tuition for our students. We, our WashU does offer financial aid for students. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me about the program. And we do have some opportunities which come up for uh, students to, do, to work in the department while they are getting their degree. So in summary, medical physicists, we work to ensure the safe and effective delivery of radiation and radiant energy, I'll say, because ultrasound is, is sound, but it's still the same, to patients and the safety of radiation workers. Um, medical physicists, we can work to develop new technologies and techniques. And I know this has been kind of a whirlwind tour of the field, but there's a lot. It's a very interdisciplinary field. You can do a lot of different things into it. If you have a lot of different areas, interest in areas of science, there's really a place for you in medical phys physics. And those of us who work in it enjoy, enjoy doing it. And we have a master's of science program which can help you get into the field if you're interested. And if you have any questions, you can ask me now or please let me uh, email me at my email address, which I posted here. So thank you, that's all. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate you uh, coming over and, or well, coming on Zoom and uh, giving a talk to, uh, to our students today. Um, and I think these are some really great uh, opportunities um, that, that our students can take advantage of um, in, in the future. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that um, you ask them a lot of questions. Um, I, I unfortunately do have to jump off to another meeting, but uh, one question that um, I have that um, yeah, it might be of interest to those who um, might think about pursuing medical physics is what um, should they take besides the physics major? Are there any additional chemistry or biology or math classes that you would recommend? So that's a good question. So math, we usually recommend that they have at least through calculus. Um, they, there is some things that can be helpful in certain areas of the field, um, like differential equations and things like that. Um, but a, a good basis through at least calculus is useful. The other fields, it's, it's not required, I, I would say, to get into the field. Um, my background was really, I was a physics major and my university, we really didn't take a lot else besides just straight physics, we weren't required to for our degree. Um, and even though I did a, my PhD actually had a lot of radiation biology in it, I hadn't taken a biology class since high school and I was able to kind of manage with it. So um, anatomy can be useful sometimes, although you do take anatomy in graduate school. Um, so yeah, it's really, for physics, we tend to recommend they, that if you have like quantum mechanics or things that, or modern physics, things that you have like a basic understanding of radiation and, and, and some of the underlying principles that are going to belie that. But past that, I think math is, like having some upper level math can be useful. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, do we have questions for our speaker today? Nobody want to jump in and ask some questions? Okay, well, um, if there are no questions, um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Altman, for giving us your presentation on medical physics. It was um, really interesting to hear. This is something we don't hear a, a lot about. I don't think many of us even knew what medical physics was. So this was a really great talk. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to talk with everybody. Um, I wish you couldn't see my face, but that wasn't as necessary, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, if any, and uh, you know, I'm happy uh, to, uh, I can send them to you or Joe to distribute the slides if anybody's interested mm -hmm. in the field at all at any point. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to individuals about um, about the field or about um, about our group specifically if they're interested. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, send it on to, to um... To Joe, I'm 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 sure that he has a way of getting that information across. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. And Thank have you. Have a great day. Bye, you everybody. Too.